Our featured speaker is Andrew Sutherland. Andrew is the University of California's Urban Integrated Pest Management Advisor for the San Francisco Bay Area. And this extension position is part of UC's statewide IPM program, and it's provided by the UC's Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources, or UC a &R. And in this position, Andrew serves pest management professionals by conducting applied research and education programs that are informed by regular needs assessments. Um, I remember first connecting with Andrew early last summer when I was very new to my role, and um, I learned at that time that he was about to head off on a fascinating IPM sabbatical in Spain, and today we're in for a treat because we get to the opportunity to hear about this sabbatical experience. So what we're going to hear about is pest control in Spain and takeaways that can be applied to IPM practices here in California. Andrew's going to cover pest control rule, rules and regulations in Spain, key pests and typical management strategies, and areas of improvement to be learned. And some specific pests he'll talk about are peri-domestic cockroaches, rodents, social wasps, mosquitoes, and termites. So I'll pass the baton to you, Andrew. Okay, everyone can hear me all right. Sounds good. Let's get the presentation going here. All right. Okay, can you guys see the presentation in a slideshow format? Now and it's in a slideshow slideshow format. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> so I'm Andrew Sutherland, and as Shoba mentioned, I'm coming to you from University of California. I work right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. My home office is in Hayward, Alameda County, but I also serve directly. Contra Costa County, San Francisco, San Mateo, Santa Clara County. And what I do is primarily work with pest management professionals. I've met many of you in person at previous TAC meetings and other meetings, and I look forward to future times when we can get together in person, shake hands and, and really connect. Um, as Shoba mentioned, I'm going to share with you a brief tour of Spanish pest control. There's so much to say about my summer that I spent uh, working with a pest control company in Spain last year. But um, I will share some highlights and then hopefully we can talk about, um, you know, elements that are similar or different from what we have here in California with our structural uh, um, public health and nuisance pests. So um, if you want to learn more about my program uh, generally, please visit my website. You can really just Google Urban IPM. I'm usually the first return and there's a mission statement there. We work with professionals to improve pest control through research and education in order to protect our communities and the environment. So basically uh, the, the premise of IPM. Can I okay, so pause you for a second, Andrew? Yeah. Um, there's a box towards the bottom of your slide that says Teams Microsoft is sharing your screen. Is uh, it possible for you to hide that? Oh, I didn't know you guys could see Great. that. Awesome. Yeah, looks good. Thank you. Now we're looking better? Yep, looks good. We can okay. see it all now. <clears throat> so a little bit of background about this uh, IPM sabbatical. It's a non-traditional sabbatical. It's a needs assessment sabbatical. Rather than reaching out to a research institution and joining a research team, which would be kind of a traditional academic sabbatical, um, I actually put myself out there on LinkedIn where I have um, a, a healthy uh, you know, body of connections. And I offered up this opportunity um, where I would provide free technical service and my host would provide travel and lodging support. 
And the idea is that by working with a pest control company or a government agency that's doing pest control work, um, I would be immersed in their activities and thereby learn about the trends, issues, uh, challenges, and of course, um, needs of, of their particular situation and be able to bring that back to my clients here in California. And the premise is that we're all facing similar challenges in structural pest control, uh, um, public health pest control, nuisance pest control, whether it's regulations, whether it's demands from clients, and we can learn from each other. So I put this post out there in January of last year, and it became viral, you know, as far as LinkedIn is, is concerned. I mean, over uh, eventually over 200 engagements and lots of people contacted me and uh, wanted to um, host a sabbatical journey. Um, the first company that put all of the pieces together was a large uh, company in Spain called Loquimica Laboratorios. This is the second largest um, company in Spain. Um, they specialize in municipal contracts. So just like you guys have a pest control operator that services San Francisco and you know, resources that belong to the city and county of San Francisco. Uh, this company specializes in municipal contracts with uh, the autonomous community of Madrid uh, or Valencia or Alicante. So that's their specialty. They don't do a lot of residential work or um, even private commercial work. Uh, they set up um, a tour for me to visit five of their delegaciones that are all over the country, uh, all the way from Galicia in the north uh, to Valencia, Alicante, along the Mediterranean coast, and then of course Madrid in the middle. And at all of these locations, I was embedded with their technicians and I would go out every day. We worked on different pest systems um, and it was it was fascinating, you know, but it was a lot of movement, a lot of work. Uh, another thing that kind of colored this trip was that rent -a kill the largest pest control company in the world, purchased Loquimica about a month before my trip. And so I wasn't sure how this was going to change things. In the end, um, I connected with rent -a kill as well as Loquimica and provided some training um, for their technical staff in Madrid. So luckily, the relationship I had with Loquimica was maintained after it was purchased by rent -a kill In preparation for this trip, um, you know, I, I had to, I had to do a lot. Um, they told me I was going to be potentially driving vehicles, so I obtained an international driving permit. Uh, we were working on a research project while there, so they actually sent me um, a research brief that was in Spanish, technical Spanish, and I needed to study that before arriving. And, you know, a, a, another goal that I set for myself in this trip was to really improve my technical Spanish, and so this was a great crash course even before my journey began. Once I arrived in Spain, I realized that the daily schedule is quite different from what we have here uh, in California or the broader United States. Um, and it's different depending on whether you provide uh, blue collar or service labor or kind of white collar or professional labor. For me, since I was embedded with technicians, I was following the kind of the blue collar schedule. Um, and so it starts, uh, you know, you eat breakfast at home, desayuno, you begin work 6.30 or 7 a.m. We're usually on the street doing uh, cockroach or rodent service by 7 a.m. And um, if you're a white collar professional, it's more like 9 a.m. that they start, but everybody breaks at 10 a.m. for something that's called almuerzo. So in Espanol Latino, almuerzo means lunch. 
But in Spain, almuerzo is a mid-morning meal, small meal, uh, you know, small bites, little things, a lot of coffee and a lot of cigarettes. And so this meal um, occurred no matter what we were doing. If we were, uh, you know, doing sewer treatments for cockroaches, if we were doing inspections for mosquitoes, we stopped and we found the nearest cafe. And the coolest thing about Amuerzo is you cannot talk about work. You talk about your family, you talk about the weather, you talk about politics, you talk about all those things that they say you're not supposed to talk about in American uh, workplaces. Um, if you start talking about work, people are very rude to you. Uh, we go back to work after an hour of that. And um, actually the day is done by 3 p.m. That's the end of the workday if you're in kind of a blue collar service role. And then you eat your largest meal of the day. Usually uh, for these guys, it was at home, comida. And it's a heavy meal. Right afterwards, you take a siesta. If you don't take a siesta, you're still at home or you're resting because everything is closed. Nothing is open. Um, certain communities, not even uh, uh, grocery stores or um, office buildings, everything closes down. You have no choice but to spend this time with your family. You know, schools are closed, children are at home. And if you're a white collar professional worker, you actually have to go back to the office after this, um, or you're working at home, um, sometimes till 8 p.m. And then if you guys have visited Spain before, you know that they stay up very late and they eat dinner very late. Cena, the last uh, meal of the day, sometimes was as late as uh, 11.30 or even midnight. Um, and that's especially true when you're in a heat wave. You know, it's just really too hot to cook or to eat before then. So anyway, I thought you guys would enjoy this kind of daily schedule um, and, and contrast it with how we do our jobs here. Okay, so they put me to work right away, dressed me up, uh, you know, put me in um, the personal protective equipment that I needed, uh, connected me with the different um, technician groups, and I hit the ground running. What I learned right away is that there's actually a national law or series of laws that dictates how public health pest control, structural pest control, nuisance pest control is, um, is, is executed. And it's very similar to the IPM process. It requires identification of the pest. It considers preventive measures that need to be put in place before pest management is required. It uh, includes the consideration of non-chemical methods for pest control. It includes the consideration of risk and uh, reduction of risk anytime that we use a pesticide or even a non-chemical uh, pest management tactic. It was very impressive to me. This is a national law that dictates all uh, indoor pest control efforts um, uh, by professionals. It's, it's a lot more stringent than what we have in the United States. And again, I really do think that the steps of this norma española are the principles and practices of IPM. As I mentioned, there's a requirement for um, identification and knowledge of the pest organism, uh, consideration of prevention, documentation of monitoring, consideration of thresholds, uh, consideration of and documentation of multiple tactics that are used to manage pests. And um, there's also an evaluation component. So all of this is codified by law and it absolutely is IPM. They also have a form there that is required in association with every treatment and it's called El diagnosis de situación, the diagnosis of the situation. This is a form that uh, is completed by the técnico responsable, the responsible technician. 
and they basically lay out the case for treatment. They document the problem. There's information about the pest species. Uh, there's information about the monitoring methods that are being used. Um, there's also information about the urgency and the risk of this pest problem. They can attach photos digitally to this form, but the most important thing is that the responsible technician signs this form. This form is a public document. People can search for, find, and review this form, and they will find their way to the name of the person who uh, basically prescribed the treatment or oversaw the treatment. So there's a lot of responsibility embedded in all of these uh, indoor uh, uh, pesticide activities. Um, this is just an outline of what I just said here. You document the problem, identify the pest, uh, oh, I didn't mention, but they're also documenting conducive conditions. So structural flaws, uh, leaks, um, vegetation problems that are contributing to the pest problem. And so in the structural pest world in California, we do this with wood destroying pests, but um, it's, it's not always required. And I think it's really important because if we don't fix these conducive conditions, we see pests again and again uh, in the same setting, perhaps the same pests. Um, the most important thing to see here is that this form creates a lot of accountability for the responsible technician who has signed it. And so you really need to be sure that you have followed the process um, before you sign your name. And so I thought that was you know, a, a really key difference um, to, to what we see in, in California or other states in the union. Uh, one final thing to talk about here with regulations, the pesticides used in non-agricultural settings in Spain are called biocides, biocidas. Um, pesticide is, is a term used for agriculture in Europe and Biocides are actually regulated by the EU. So the uh, European Commission, part of the EU, actually has a regulatory body just like the EPA that registers, uh, approves, and regulates um, all of their uh, biocides. What kinds of pests did I see there? Well, remember, this is the public sector. So we're managing public spaces, public buildings, public assets. And so we really were looking at these uh, from a public health and um, you know structural or infrastructural uh, uh, pest problem. Peridomestic cockroaches were present in all of the sites that I visited. Primarily, we dealt with American cockroach, but they also have oriental cockroach. Rats were everywhere both species of rats, just like we deal with here in the Bay Area. Uh, for some reason, social wasps kept coming up as uh, significant nuisance pests or potential public health pests. They have a stinging venom. Uh, their nests can be very large and in areas where a lot of people uh, are, are present. Of course, mosquitoes. Spain doesn't have um, very many mosquito-borne viruses but it does have a lot of mosquitoes and um, they're very aggressive. I'll talk more about that. And then some other uh, biting pests or potential vectors, including black flies. I get a, a chance to work with a black fly treatment program. And then yes, they do have termites. They have uh, subterranean termites as well as um, the West Indian drywood termite, uh, Cryptotermes brevis. Uh, present along the coast. So let's get right into it. Um, we did a lot of work in municipal sewer systems. Those of you who are connected with me on LinkedIn have already seen this video. It was another uh, quasi viral post. But what you're seeing here is an old uh, sewer system in a suburb of Barcelona. And so um, Concrete has been pasted over the old elements of the sewer, but you've got lots and lots of crevices in here. And, um, you know, really 
uh, you know, poor, poor, poorly sealed um, conduits, and there is no treatment being made in this sewer system. In some sense, it's okay that we have cockroaches in the sewer, but uh, in many cases, the density is so high that they're able to get out from these manholes or out from drains and start uh, posing nuisance or public health problems in homes and restaurants nearby. So most of the time, these pest control companies are actually applying pyrethroids. Um, these were very common products that I saw that contain a mix of a pyrethroid and an insect growth regulator. And these were sprayed right at the entrances to these manholes. So this is something that we don't do in California because of our surface water regulations. Um, but there's other reasons why you might not want to use this kind of approach for cockroach management. The biggest one is pyrethroids are repellent. So after an application like this, you have this push of cockroaches trying to get out of the sewer. And so inevitably, the operators had to tape the seams of these manholes uh, or we were actually out there on the street uh, doing la cucaracha dance, trying to stomp on the cockroaches that were escaping so that they wouldn't uh, be terrorizing nearby restaurants and homes. And um, so this photo, these photos were taken in Alicante where we did this work at you know 6 or 7 a.m. That's when the clubs were getting out. So we have, you know, people that have been partying in the clubs all day walking past us as we're doing this cockroach dance in the street. It was pretty interesting to explain to them what was going on. Cockroaches can be so dense in these environments that they interfere with the rodent management program. So this is um, a block of uh, anticoagulant rodenticide and the cockroaches eat it. You know, it contains grains and other foods for them. And um, the rats are less interested when it's been contaminated like this. It's full of insect feces, uh, riddled with holes. It starts to dry out. Um, and so that's, that's another reason why they manage cockroaches is because they may interfere with uh, the rodent program. So um, another problem is residences, old residences that were in place sometimes hundreds of years, bordering on thousands of years before the municipal sewer system have these old systems called arquetas that take the waste from the household into the municipal sewer. And so these areas are never treated by um, municipalities or pest control operators, and they serve as a reservoir uh, for American cockroaches to, to recolonize certain um, sewer sections. We also saw problems with post-pandemic uh, use of uh, retail and public spaces. So all of our uh, drains, whether they're, you know, sink, shower, toilet, they have um, a water trap, you know, um, a P trap or an S trap that prevents vapor from coming up from the sewer, but also uh, helps prevent cockroaches and rodents from coming up. But if a bathroom goes unused for a long time, the water within that trap uh, dries out. And so this was in a bathroom in a retail environment in Madrid. And so the retail store had been closed for over a year. And of course, everything was dried out. And this provided access for thousands of American cockroaches coming up from the sewer. So we dealt with situations like this, uh, where really the solution was to reinstill those um, exclusion boundaries for cockroaches and try to clean up what we had inside the store. They also did some subsurface baiting for cockroaches. So you'll see this gentleman being lowered down into the sewer system. Um, this is in the Gothic quarter of Barcelona. And um, he has dangling from his vest here, um, what looks like a caulking gun. It is a caulking gun. And it, it, it contains a 350 gram tube of cockroach bait. 
Um, typically, when we're working with cockroach bait here, we use 30 gram tubes. So this is more than 10 times the volume. And uh, they use this stuff liberally uh, in the sewer system to try to knock down the American cockroach populations. This also includes cypermethrin as its active ingredient. And I've never seen baits that include cypermethrin until I, I went to Spain. I was always taught that pyrethroids are repellent and that's why they're not used in baits, but the manufacturers of this product claim that the attractant qualities overcome the repellent qualities. It's also a very cheap product. And so they're using a lot of it in these urban environments in Spain. Another product being used there is a paint. Um, this is a paint that gets applied on the top uh, meter or so of these manholes. It's repellent. It includes um, uh, a pyrethroid. It also includes uh, pyroproxifen, which is an insect growth regulator. And um, there's a trial that's underway in Sacramento looking at this product. Again, it flies in the face of our surface water regulations because it includes a pyrethroid, but it seems to be very effective uh, in Europe right now. I was also there to investigate a new uh, bait product. This is also a cypermethrin product. It's a compressed granule, compressed into kind of a donut shape. And we could actually suspend these into the sewer on the plastic hooks that we use for uh, rodent bait. And um, my job was to help evaluate the efficacy of this product in a couple locations in Spain. And so what we saw is that regular applications of this bait uh, can maintain populations um, at a lower density. But when you have uh, very high densities of American cockroach, it doesn't seem to provide the control that may be required. So it's kind of, we determined it to be a maintenance product. Um, if it's used regularly, it could maintain populations below damaging levels. We also had oriental cockroach, especially in the more temperate parts of Spain. The interesting thing is that these guys were only found above ground um, in areas where we have American cockroach. What you're looking at here is an irrigation uh, register or kind of a valve. Think of it as like a big uh, valve uh, utility box for irrigation. So these systems were separated from the sewer systems and that's the only place that you're gonna find the oriental cockroach. Um, that's because the American cockroach is very aggressive and actually preys on the oriental cockroach. So we only found them in places like urban parks and gardens, um, especially associated with irrigation uh, valve containers. Very interesting, um, I saw a lot of these parasitoid wasps, okay? So this is called Evania appendigaster. It is an Otheca parasitoid. So these wasps lay one egg in a cockroach Otheca, which may contain you know, uh, 15 to 20 eggs, and the larva of the wasp eats all of the eggs within the Oatheca, but they're very sensitive to the sprays that were being used there. So um, I talked a lot with this company about incorporating uh, knowledge of this wasp. If the wasp is present, I think bait should be used rather than sprays. Uh, the wasp, larva eats the eggs. So the eggs are not exposed to bait and therefore it could be a compatible uh, IPM system. Moving on to rats. Um, the biggest issue was Norway rats in the sewer and other subsurface systems. And so they do a lot of baiting with anticoagulants. Uh, rats also moved into buildings um, anytime we were using this expanding foam to seal conduits, the rats use it as a super highway. And you guys may see similar problems here in San Francisco, um, but the rats can easily chew through this and gain access 
uh, to buildings and other, homes and other structures. Um, we also saw evidence of Norway rats uh, living in parks, uh, tree wells, uh, other um, urban environments that were separated from the sewer. And in fact, uh, population studies have shown that these above ground rats are uh, genetically distinct be from the sewer rats in that they are um, isolated breeding populations. So the sewer rats don't interact with the above ground rats that much, uh, even though they're all of the same species. And so these rats, of course, cause a lot of problems because they're so close to humans where humans are eating, uh, walking, playing, and um, there were a lot of baits being used for these guys as well. Very little trapping uh, for rats observed in Spain. We also had roof rats, um, very common, especially in parks, uh, areas with fruit trees, nut trees. One of the worst roof rat infestations I saw was at the Barcelona Zoo, um, where you've got lots of food available. You've got food that's just freely uh, out, you know, for the animals to eat, sometimes left out overnight. And so you have these very large populations of, of rats running around. Um, one product I saw in use, <clears throat> well, a lot of these products actually are second generation anticoagulants. And so these are restricted here in California in a way that they are not in Europe. And in fact, the um, Spanish pest control groups were very surprised to hear about our restrictions. And um, they were, you know, kind of scared that such restrictions might come to the European Union one day, but currently they use a lot of these anticoagulants and they even have some formulations which are not legal in California. So in the lower left, you actually see a gel that's applied with a caulking gun uh, that contains uh, brodificum. And so here's an image of uh, a technician applying this gel into the burrow. This is a roof rat burrow. You know, roof rats will burrow just like Norway rats. This is within the enclosure of some birds at the Barcelona Zoo. And so the chance for secondary poisoning seems very high in these cases. And I couldn't believe that it was a legal application, but it's very common. Let's move on to social wasps. Um, for whatever reason, last summer was the summer of social wasps in Spain. We got a lot of calls, um, a lot for uh, paper wasps, which I don't consider to be significant pests. They're not aggressive. This is their native species, Polistes dominula. It's also invasive here in California. It's quite easy to find. And, you know, if you're familiar, familiar with paper wasps, they form these exposed small nests dozens of wasps, maybe up to 100 wasps, and they're not aggressive, but when they form nests near uh, where humans are, are walking or sitting or eating, um, they can cause problems. Um, this was a case where we had some equipment on top of a building in Madrid, and it was uh, sitting up there for years, filled with paper wasp nests, and when the workers went up to start cleaning it all up, they got stung. So we came in and uh, removed some nests physically, uh, but also they were using a pyrethroid uh, wasp freeze, wasp spray. In most of these cases, the paper wasps were not posing significant pest problems, but here are some examples where they do. You're looking at the inside of uh, trash and recycling receptacles. Um, People in Spain uh, take their own trash to these receptacles daily. There's no uh, collection from your home. You have to walk down the street and put them in these receptacles. And in these cases, we have wasps nesting right there where you would stick your hand in. And so people were getting stung here. Uh, both of these nests were physically knocked down. There were no insecticides used. Um, but there are also cases that I feel are not uh, justified as pest problems. Um, 
there was uh, a case of um, a bodega, so like a wine uh, tasting room in Alicante that was trapping for paper wasps because they were so concerned about paper wasps bothering their um, patrons while they were tasting their wine. And so I thought it was great that they were monitoring, but anytime they caught even just one wasp, they were making these excessive liquid applications to the eaves of the building. And I'll show you a video of what that looks like. This is actually a, a mosquito power sprayer truck uh, making a pyrethroid application to the underside of the eaves and the Spanish tile on the roof of this bodega. We had to do it in the early hours before dawn because they didn't want anybody to see what they were doing. And it's amazing to me that, um, you know, uh, a, a food or, you know, beverage environment uh, was willing to have that much ex potential exposure to an insecticide. We were making these applications every couple of weeks. And um, paper wasps are not significant stinging pests, but the tolerance for stinging pests in Europe, in Spain, was way lower than what I see in California. It was really eye-opening to me. If the animal stings or bites, you have to eliminate all of them from the planet Earth. That was the idea. Uh, they also had yellow jackets, and so this is a common species. It's their native um, German yellow jacket, which we also have as an invasive species here. Uh, it's very common for them to nest in wall voids. So here you're looking at cinder block walls at the Barcelona Zoo. This was in a goat enclosure, and so the goats uh, would sometimes get stung when they were eating their hay, and so we uh, were, you know, we made an application um, directly to the nest entrance. That was a pretty easy one. And then we could seal it up with mortar. And I think we do similar treatments here in the United States. This was a justified application in, in my um, opinion. A really cool wasp that they're dealing with there is an invasive species from Asia, Vespa velutina. Uh, called the Asian wasp. It's not the murder hornet, but it's in the same genus. And you'll see that it's probably three times the mass of a yellow jacket. So it's basically a giant yellow jacket. They uh, create these really large aerial nests. They can be very aggressive. And just like yellow jackets, they're attracted to uh, human foods, um, proteins in the spring, and then uh, more like uh, sweets and simple carbohydrates in the summer and fall. So here you've got um, a fallen pear in a park in Northern Spain, and um, this was in September. And so in an environment like this, you can have incidental stings, and that's why this uh, wasp is managed as a pest. And this is a really cool video. I hope you guys can see this. Uh, basically, you'll notice a dead rat on the ground, and then you'll notice one of these Vespa velutina hovering and darting around. And um, if you guys have access to your audio, uh, somebody tell me what you think this wasp is doing. I don't know if we have time for that, but any ideas? We do have time for that. If there are any ideas, you could unmute and guess or type your thoughts in the chat. Yeah, we what have, is this wasp doing? You see how it hovers and then it darts. We have a guess from Christina in the chat, laying eggs. It's not laying eggs, so this is a worker wasp. It's sterile, uh, but remember, <clears throat> these wasps are searching for protein to feed their larvae, just like yellow jackets do here in California. And so I've had people say, oh, well, it's, uh, it's, it's eating meat from the dead rat. It's not. It's catching flies. So the flies are attracted to the carcass, and this wasp is trying to catch the flies. It will then incapacitate the flies, uh, bring them back to the larvae. And so you'll see paper wasps and yellow jackets hunt uh, caterpillars and spiders and 
all kinds of other arthropods. And so this was a really cool case of a, a hunting wasp. And also you're looking at a Vespa under a Vespa. Okay, at the zoo in Barcelona, um, we also had interference with some animal feeding programs. So this is um, the enclosure for the kookaburra. The kookaburra is a very large kingfisher from Australia. It's an omnivore, but it likes meat. And so you'll see here in the tray, a yellow jacket that's actually trying to chew off pieces of, this, uh, of these pinky mice that are in there. But the Vespa is actually trying to take off with this entire grasshopper. So the kookaburra did not want to eat its food. And this is another reason why uh, we manage wasps like this. Um, there's also trapping being done for this wasp. Uh, you're looking at a cemetery in northern Spain that has a high population of Vespa velutina. And um, they you know, were stinging people who were visiting uh, you know, their, their loved ones, their departed loved ones, they bring flowers. And so the wasps may be attracted to the flowers. And so they actually set up a perimeter trapping program. And this is how many wasps they were catching every two weeks. You know, so we counted over 200 wasps in this container. And this was effective at reducing stings. It doesn't eliminate the wasp from the area, but it does reduce the stings in these areas. Uh, finally, um, with this Vespa Velutina, I got a chance to participate in um, a really cool management tactic that this company, Lokimica, has invented. So you see a gun and you're wondering what's going on here. That is a paintball rifle. And so Lokimica has developed a technique where they actually freeze um, liquid that is a solution of cypermethrin, um, so that's a pyrethroid insecticide, and then they uh, fill um, paintball shells with this. And so we were shooting um, insecticide-laden paintballs at aerial nests. And the idea is that the paintball will penetrate the nest a little bit. These nests are huge, you know, basically basketball size or bigger. And um, if you penetrate the nest with these, the wasps will kind of swarm and try to remove the foreign object. They get coated with the insecticide. As the insecticide um, popsicle, if you will, thaws, it permeates the nest and you can eliminate an entire uh, large nest of uh, hundreds, you know, up to a thousand wasps. And they quickly realized that I had shooting skills. So remember, I'm just a country boy who grew up in Central Florida. So I grew up, uh, you know, hunting um, and I know how to shoot. And so they ended up bringing me to a lot of these jobs because nobody knows how to shoot in Europe. Uh, okay, let's go on to um, mosquito control. So um, it's similar to California in that the public agencies are responsible for mosquito and vector control. However, they do not have vector control agencies. Instead, they contract with private companies. And so the private companies are responsible for, for providing community-wide surveillance and control programs. It's a humongous job and they need help. Um, luckily, they do not have any significant arboviruses yet in Spain. Um, one project that I helped out with is called Proyecto Nesco Tiger. And so this is an educational program aimed at residents along the Mediterranean coast where they have the Asian tiger mosquito, Aedes albopictus, which is a vector for dengue, chikungunya, Zika, none of which they have yet. Um, but as you know, if you work with this mosquito, they can breed in lots of small um, volumes of water that may be in containers in people's backyards. And so it's a different kind of mosquito management program from like a marshland or uh, a tide, a tide water mosquito. And um, the residents are not as familiar 
So we did a lot of door-to-door -door education and door-to-door -door surveillance. And we always found mosquitoes because these guys can breed even in the saucers of, um, of uh, potted plants. Um, but this is a case where there was a disused or underused uh, pool pump um, enclosure that had thousands and thousands of um, Asian tiger mosquito larvae uh, contributing to a mosquito problem in the whole neighborhood. So um, Asian tiger mosquito is, is quickly colonizing Spain and it's a, a day biting mosquito, very aggressive. And this has changed the game um, of vector management in Spain. It's something that we may be dealing with in California as different aides species expand their ranges here. Another problem with mosquito management that I saw in Spain is whose responsibility is larval management? There's lots of these beautiful urban parks and gardens and they all have water features. A lot of times the water features are just wriggling with mosquito larvae and so this photo on the bottom right is the technicians and park staff kind of talking about whose responsibility it is and what they're going to do, uh, you know, once they find problems like this. Um, so I don't know if we have similar issues in California because we have vector control that kind of oversees all of this and works with all of the different entities. It might be a better model that we have here. I got a chance to work with um, some mulid black flies. So these are uh, flies that develop as larvae in fast-moving rivers and streams, but then the adults fly out as far as four or five miles and they seek blood. And um, the bites can be pretty painful. In Africa, they actually transmit a disease, but in Spain, they're just a nuisance. And the interesting thing is that we have black flies in the, in the United States, you can find them in the Sierra or the, the, even the coast range, but nobody manages them as pests. They're just accepted as part of that rural environment. But again, in Spain, if the animal bites you, we have to kill all of them. So they had programs where they were applying uh, BT, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis um, insecticides to these streams and the program was completely futile. Uh, there's no way you can apply enough of this insecticide given the volume of the creek, uh, the flow of the creek, and the density of the black fly larvae, which I'm showing you on this um, vegetation that was uh, submerged in the water. And so this is a case where they really were not following an IPM process. They were, they were making money. Uh, sometimes, you know, and I got into arguments with them about this and they said, sometimes you have to take off your entomologist hat and put on your business hat. And I wonder if we have a similar issue in the United States where we know about the IPM process, but we choose to make money instead. Uh, finally, um, I did get a chance to work with some tick surveillance. Um, they have a genus there, Hyaloma, which is an active host seeker. So it does not quest, it does not wait on vegetation for hosts. It actually crawls around looking for hosts. And so it's really amazing to see these guys walking at you, trying to get at you in the field. And um, just like most ticks, they do transmit uh, uh, bacteria that, that can make you sick. Um, I did see reticulotermies there. Most buildings in Spain are constructed of stone, mortar, concrete. Um, but they all have wooden features. Uh, in this case, you're looking at a wooden door frame, which is inside, you know, you can see the exterior door of this building down the hall, but the termites can um, tunnel under the stone foundation, find cracks and crevices, and then come up into these wooden features. So even though we have um, very little wood construction, we have wooden elements and they get hammered by uh, subterranean termites there. Um, they are using baits, above ground baits, 
most of the urban areas in Spain do not have access to the soil. They're all paved over or, um, uh, you know, th there's just no access. So rather than the in-ground stations that we use here, uh, we're using a lot of these above ground stations, which are installed uh, in line with the shelter tubes that we can see. This is a basement in Galicia. So I made a lot of friends and I'm still connecting with these guys on WhatsApp uh, or via email um, almost weekly. And uh, it was an amazing experience. I can't wait to do the same thing in another country and really learn about trends and issues and bring that back to you guys because I think we can learn a lot from each other.